Hello, and welcome to today's Cybersecurity Summit Power Hour. My name is Rick. I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties joining the WebEx session, please submit a question using the Q&A panel. During the presentation, all participants will remain in listen-only mode, and as a reminder, this event is being recorded for rebroadcast. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of each of today's presentations. We encourage you to submit written questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A panel at the bottom right of your screen. Please type your questions into the text field and hit send. Please keep the drop down as all panelists. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Bradford Rand, CEO of the Cybersecurity Summit. Bradford, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, let's get video on. Here we go, great. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I see we have many people joining us, uh, over 200 executives uh, around the country, but primarily in the Northeast and the, and the DC area. Um, we have a great lineup today with security briefings from the FBI, SailPoint, IBM, and the Department of Homeland Security's cyber division called CISA. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you join us for the entire duration, you'll be getting a CPE certificate via email. And uh, all I suggest you do is take some good notes. Most of the slides will be available in approximately two days after this webcast on Cyber Summit USA. And uh, without further ado, we're going to jump right into this and uh, kick it off with Joel Max. He's the Intel analyst at the FBI's Cybercrime Division. Joel, can you hear us? Um, from SailPoint, we're going to bring up uh, Michael Kaiser, the next part there. He's with the office of the CTO. Uh, many of you have recognized him because he has the famous hat on. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Bradford, for having me. Okay, Lottery Hackers. Okay, take it away. The floor is thank yours. You. Thank you very much. Um, as you noted, that's a great segue, in fact, into uh, my discussion. Uh, the idea here is that identity is in the ascendancy, um, both in culture and society at large, given that we're all at home and trying to secure things through identity rather than network proximity. You may have heard the concept of zero trust and culturally it's shifting. And so I wanted to take some time to explore today what that looks like how things are shifting a bit and how that impacts how you secure resources within your organizations. And we're going to do that today with the story of this man and his wife. This is Jerry Selby. Now, now Jerry um, is actually the subject of our title of our presentation, Lottery Hackers, but he didn't start out that way. Jerry worked in Michigan for years and years back in the 1960s. And he worked for Kellogg's um, doing some design, some packaging. But Jerry had many hobbies. He had many uh, talents. And one of those was that he was a mathematical savant. Uh, he could look at numbers and see instant patterns. In fact, one day he was staring at a competitor's box in the store. And he, he saw the expiration date, but he also saw a series of codes on the box. And soon enough, he figured out how to decipher those codes, which uh, led him to examine, uh, believe it or not, freshness of cereals, and led him over time using those mathematical processes and, and testing of, of different samples of competitors and his own boxes into developing uh, co-helping to develop the interior packaging for cereal. Uh, so that if you've enjoyed a breakfast cereal in the last 30, 40, 50 years, and it's been crunchy and fresh, you have Jerry in part to thank for that. as mathematical genius applied to the freshness of breakfast cereals, as pedantic as that sounds. Uh, but Jerry, after he retired, in the early 2000s, started running a convenience store. And as part of his, his normal daily routine, he would put out lottery tickets in Michigan for sale. And as he was doing this, one day he looked 
at the back of one of these games called Cash Windfall that was being run out of Michigan at the time. And he looked at the numbers on the back of the cards. You know, they print out the stats about your odds of winning and one and four and, and this type of thing. Well, Jerry realized something. You could buy one of these tickets for $1 and you pick six numbers, one through 49. They would draw six numbers. If you got it right, you get $2 million, which is normal. And then there were lesser amounts for fewer numbers. Uh, but Jerry realized that if, if nobody won the jackpot for a while and the jackpot went up above $5 million, if still no one won the next week, all those prizes would roll down to the next level. And effectively, what that meant was that that $1 lottery ticket was no longer worth $1. It was statistically worth more than $1. Jerry, through his mathematical genius, had seen a flaw in the structure of the odd system. And so he and his wife exploited that flaw for lots and lots of money. And so I, I love the story about Jerry because it shows that duality, right? Jerry had both the good and the bad. He had, he could use his mathematical genius to enhance uh, something that benefited society, even if it's just having crunchy cereal. And he could also use his mathematical genius for nefarious purposes to exploit systems that are weak. And identity for our organizations, your organization, is the same thing. Uh, it can enhance uh, the security strategy and the use by your employees and people who want to uh, be customers of your organization, or it can be exploited. And so we'd like to take a little bit of time today to look at each of those in turn, starting with enhancement. Now, identity, as I said, is expanding, and it's expanding in a couple of different ways. I'm just going to hit two of those. There are manifold more. Uh, one of these is the concept of digital identity. Uh, there are a series of nine or ten international governments that are already working together to develop digital identity. Basically, the, the translation of a driver's license or a federal identity is being issued to these citizens so that they can do taxes, so that they can vote, so they can do various uh, interactions with their government. And the U.S., of course, is no exception. There are a number of pilot programs already in place that are doing that. And that's going to fundamentally change how we think about identity, because now it's not just going to be a hub and spoke with an organization or an enterprise at the center, but you'll have other major players entering the digital sphere, such as the government. And so we'll have to consider that as a broadening or expanding of identity. Another one is probably one you've already run into. It's that the concept of identity is no longer restricted to humans. Uh, the most direct uh, application of this is something called RPA, or robotic process automation. And it, it's part of uh, what I call the Internet of Things spectrum, right? When you talk about anything, any identity that's not Solo, solely human-based, you need to think about what you're actually talking about. And identity is expanding into a whole spectrum of things. Uh, and it goes up a spectrum, as you can see from this, this picture, all the way from passive devices like cameras that just need protection up to, to independent agents or that robotic process automation I was talking about, where uh, it can not only... Uh, to perform uh, some tasks, but needs some access to resources, all the way to artificial intelligence. And with, with that, you know, an example of that, just choose whatever apocalyptic artificial intelligence movie you want to choose. And you can see that as it goes up the spectrum, the identity concept expands, right? From a, just needing to be protected to, to mild, very focused access to full-on uh, access and a, a full-fledged identity. And as that access goes up, that entitlement goes up, and that risk level goes up as well. So that's another thing we'd have to consider as identity is expanding. And why is all this happening? Well, uh, there are various reasons, efficiency and, and other options, but upshot is user experience, right? If you think about working from home, as was noted before, no longer are you waiting on that network firewall for access. No longer are you getting access because you are physically on the local network, but somehow your identity is being used 
to validate that access and give you the right access. And it's all about that user experience, right? You don't want to be slowed down. And so all this innovation, this robotic process automation to speed uh, response time with customer service agents or order fulfillment and the digital ID aspect, uh, who wouldn't want to pay their taxes securely online with a minimum of paperwork? So Jerry, when he was asked about how he enhanced the crispiness of cereal, he, they asked him, how did, how, did you, how did you pilot this program, this innovation, this new use of technology, if you will? And he, being the uh, uh, person from Michigan that he was, he described it charmingly as like growing tomatoes. Uh, if you've ever grown tomatoes, uh, you know that things can get out of hand really, really quickly, right? If you plant too many plants, you're going to have tomatoes until 2023, which might not be bad at this point. But what you want to do as you expand identity within your organization, uh, whether it's uh, transforming more to a digital identity model or decentralized identity, or even just using robotic process automation or containers, something that needs identity that's non-human, what you want to do is start off slow. Look for patterns of growth that you can optimize by expanding identity and improving that user experience and that speed and that scale. Start small, prove viability, and expand the program. So that's kind of an idea of, of how identity is being used to enhance uh, the experience of our customers and the security of our organization. Um, let's talk about the, the other aspect, uh, exploitation, how identity can be used to exploit things within your enterprise and how we can print, prevent that exploitation. And let's go back to Jerry and his uh, money-making opportunity here. Like I said, he had uh, access to uh, the lottery tickets that he was buying. And just like that growing tomatoes aspect, he started small. In 2003, he put in a couple thousand dollars and he lost fifty dollars the first time he played he bought a bunch of tickets scratched them off but jerry trusted his math he trusted statistics and so the next time he played he got more money and more money and a year later he was making about three thousand dollars every time he played uh, once he hit five digits he finally told his wife what he was doing and and she was on board at that point point. and over time his winnings grew very rapidly and by 2006, he had friends, he had family involved. Uh, he and his wife were spending weekends on the, the key roll down weeks for the lottery. They were buying hundreds and thousands of tickets and then sorting them all by hand. But he was pulling in multiple tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars every time he played. And he accumulated over $750,000 by 2006. He bought himself a truck. He bought his wife a few nice things. Uh, but the key was in very short time, uh, that exploit grew out of control and it grew very rapidly. And as we secure identity, even as it expands, oddly enough, it's not always a technology issue. Sometimes it's a discovery issue of how people within our organizations, especially if they're large enough, are using identity. I've talked to a number of customers who uh, quite a few who found out that they had people in their organizations assigning identities to programs, assigning identities to bots or containers, and they weren't telling anybody. Some of these were being reused, and sometimes the identities were expanding quite rapidly. So it's really important to ask questions, to check what the initiatives are for your organization, to to find out what automation efforts in particular are being used. A lot of times it's DevOps or these kinds of things are spinning up and using identities at will before it gets out of hand. We had uh, one customer that discovered that they had no fewer than eight different sub-departments uh, reusing identities for some of their robotic process automation and some of their uh, automatic uh, DevOps-based identities in the organization. And by the time you discover it, uh, that's too late. Now, it's not just political. There are some tools you can use. And if, if we take identity and we kind of break it into three parts, attributes, access, and activity, attributes, of course, are just 
things about the identity, a job title or location or anything like that. And then the access that identity has. And then the third aspect would be activity or behavior, how that identity uses that access. Uh, if, we, if we zoom out and take all of our identities and use those three axes of attributes, access, and activity, and we start to draw and make connections between all of these as, as kind of points of affinity for them, well, we get a picture that results something like this. And now we get a much view, better view at scale of how identity is being used in our organizations. And more importantly, we can see these blue clusters of affinity, basically identities that are in affinity with each other. Either they're the same job title or similar department, similar activity, similar behavioral patterns, whatever it is, these blue areas can express areas of normality. And then likewise, all the little dots around the edge are outliers, are things that are different or odd, or might be uses of identity we didn't know, we didn't expect, and we need to go and investigate. That's why we're helping to discover uh, those outliers or those unusual events. And so once we discover it, then we can start to apply governance to identity. Now, back to Jerry again. Um, it continued to play over time. And like I said, he had $750,000 uh, by 2006. And, you know, he kept winning. And by 2009, he had about $4 million, $700,000, somewhere in there. Now, things changed around 2007, 2008. Michigan shut down its lottery game. It, end of life did it, had a good run, they retired it. Uh, but a friend told Jerry about a game in Massachusetts that had been set up, also called Windfall, with a very similar flaw. And so Jerry was a retiree, and so he and his wife now started driving 12 hours from Michigan to Massachusetts on particular key weekends. They would get a motel room, they would buy an insane number of tickets, and they would spend all weekend going through the tickets, cashing out the winnings, and driving the 12 hours back to Michigan. And over time, they wound up winning over $7 million, almost $8 million. Now, the interesting thing about this part of the story is that they weren't alone. Uh, there's a group from MIT that had discovered the same flaw, and they started banded together and forming a, a similar large group of investors, just like Jerry had done with his family and friends. And there was also a, uh, a geneticist at Boston College who left his research position to head up a group playing uh, the Massachusetts lottery. And what that did, of course, was resulted in a massive number of tickets being purchased on particular key weekends. And Massachusetts lottery, like most lotteries, are, are governed, and they have analytics in play. And what they noticed was this odd correlation. On some weekends, there was 5, 10, 20 times the number of tickets sold. And because they were all machine dispensed, they could pinpoint locations where those were being done, now where those were being purchased. So they could hunt down and investigate. And so eventually... These large purchases were seen as outliers, seen as sources of risk. Now, Jerry and the others had done nothing wrong, technically. They were playing by the rules of the game, and so there were no criminal charges filed. But there was a huge scandal in the media. The attorney general got involved, and, of course, the game was shut down once these outliers and this perception of unfairness was revealed. And that's because the, the government of Massachusetts you know, realized uh, they investigated in the first place because they knew that outliers equaled risk. And with that chart, if we zoom in a little bit deeper on that graph I showed you before, this is a real world organization. And like I said, you can see the pools of normalcy in blue. Uh, this is expected behavior, expected attributes, expected uses of identity. And then you have these outliers in red that represent risk. And so the name of the game is to eliminate those outliers, to eliminate that unexpected use of identity, that unexpected access to a privileged account or to sensitive data or to something that, some kind of behavior that's risky and eliminate that over time. 
And with SailPlot, what we do is we take those points of normalcy and we apply identity governance. So we, we take the identity and we translate that into appropriate access for the appropriate time. And what we can do with those blue pools of normality is we can begin to analyze them on entitlements, on access, on activity, and begin to describe that normalcy. So for here, we can, with those blue groups, we can treat them like a peer group and say, what's common to this group? What entitlements, what access, what activity? And then even more interesting, we can see what's representative. In other words, not just what does everybody have in this group, but what makes this group unique from all the other groups. Once we have that, now we can start to make recommendations to business users and say, look, this person doesn't need this access or does need this access. Because all too often, there's a lot of decisions that need to be made about who should have what access and annual reviews and auditing and those sorts of things for compliance purposes. Now, if you look at the recommendation, it, you know, it's saying not recommended. You shouldn't approve of this to the human user, but it's also giving an explanation. You see where it says 6% of peers have the same access. That's really important because what we don't want to do is all too often people use technology or solutions or platforms and they trust them implicitly. They say, well, that must be right because math effectively. And that's not what you want. You want accountability in any system you use. The way I explain it is think back to a time before you had a mobile device. How many, members, how many numbers did you have memorized in your head? 15, 20, 25, depending on how popular you were. But once you got a mobile device, what happened? The number of numbers that you had memorized reduced to 10, to 5, to 1. And, and then you even forgot you know, the most important numbers to you of all. Uh, what you've done is you ceded control to your device. You deceded that function to them. That's what we don't want to have happen. And so when those recommendations are made, we have the explanation. And so that way, human users are educated, even as they're getting recommendations from an automated system. Furthermore, if you look at the second item here, reason for this entitlement is not being recommended, it says a low percentage of approval. What that means is that it's, it's realized that over time, most human users have not approved this access. And so it's saying actually everyone else who's been asked to decide yes or no on this, this access, this entitlement, have said no. And so now we're cooking with gas, right? Because we're not just using uh, machine learning or technology and trusting it implicitly. And we're also not forcing human users to do everything uh, we're informing both. Humans are learning from uh, the machines, and machines are learning from the humans, and now they're locked in this virtuous loop. We're getting the best of both worlds, and that's what is necessary if we're going to eliminate those outliers and clean up our environments to reduce those areas of risk. So just to sum up, it's, it's a process of discovering and then governing that use of identity. And that's what zero trust and these other security approaches are. It's the elevation of identity, using it to enhance our security, to enable a better experience for our end users, and then to use it as a key cog in a, a security strategy that puts identity at the forefront and prevents exploitation. And when we do that, uh, just a reminder, uh, three takeaways, right? As you expand secure identity in your organizations, do it slowly, do it like tomatoes. You might want to think about it before you present that concept to the board, you know, use it as appropriately. And then you need to discover uh, who's using identity in your organizations and then govern it well um, by enforcing the normals within your organization. And this kind of technique is adaptive, right? Uh, just as, as Jerry adapted his techniques uh, for different lotteries and, and different circumstances, this kind of flexible approach, unlike the old ways of locking down based on filters or network proximity, uh, now it has flexibility. Your workforce gets moved to be working from home for six to eight weeks. That's fine. That's a new normal. The system adapts, the system learns, and it's flexible because it's based on identity rather than hard and set rules. So we can learn from Jerry's example, and it's a, just a great way to explore um, how things can be used 
for good and for bad within our security strategy. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mike. That was wonderful. Very, very entertaining. I've never, uh, I've never known about that story. That's terrific. Um, oh, quick question: What did he do with all that money? He didn't get arrested. What did he end up doing? Well, did he, did he banned from ever playing lotto again? No, no, there were no consequences. Now there's a lot of bad. He still plays the lottery. There's a lot of bad publicity to him. It was very mechanical. They sure. were uh, salt of the earth people. When before they started playing, they had no dishwasher. They won seven million, eight million dollars. They put their kids through college. They put their grandchildren through college. Still haven't bought a dishwasher. <laughs> they're just they're they're not about the money. For him, it was more about the math and and just the game. The game, I guess maybe yeah. the, thrill, the thrill of winning. True, just, true confession. <laughs> I for the pictures for this presentation, I had to actually buy. If you notice, the lottery. Uh, Tickets are from Texas. I right. had to buy some scratch off because proprietary, right? So I took pictures and then a friend said, Well, have you scratched them off? And I wow. said, No, I should go do that. I won $700. So awesome. bonus. Anyway, so yeah, they're not about the money. Absolutely. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. Um, how has identity changed uh, in the past few months, uh, especially as it relates to identity centric security approaches uh, like zero trust? Sure. I, I mean, there are elements of zero trust, and you'll hear, you know, from our next speaker about this, obviously, in more detail. But right. there are aspects that have more prominence now. You think of, as you noted before, a device being part of your identity. I think it's accelerated that process where now your your mobile device or your laptop, whatever else, is much more bound with your identity. Because before you might have been using that, but now it's your primary route in. And so companies have really had to decide. Uh, and rethink policies like bring your own device, because what if you had to onboard 2,000 contingent workers? How do you do that and equip them uh, with the right device to do it? Do you let them buy their own device and then secure it down? So anyway, there's a, a lot of identity expansion there that's been taking place and starting to blur the line between work and normal life identity as well. Okay. Uh, here's a question from... Uh... From John, I guess from the DC area, uh, it seems like things like KBA is essentially dead. What do you think will be the successor to current identity verification trends, given the pandemic forcing more remote work? Long term, I think we're talking five, six years. Uh, there's a lot of innovation going on in the financial sector that kind of points where the future is, which is odd but real. Um, especially in Europe, but some in the U.S., where those mobile devices come into play. And so just like you carry a driver's license in your wallet, you would have credentials and identity issued to your mobile device, locked down cryptographically and secured in that way, and then you can present those credentials uh, to third-party systems. So instead of, of passwords per se, it would be locked down on your side, but you wouldn't authenticate with that. You would lock in, you would log in with some other kind of identity proofing. Uh, there's, a, like I said, there's a lot of innovation in the pandemic, even in the UK, you can scan a government issued ID and open a business bank account mm -hmm. with certain organizations even. So that's, uh, it's tricky how to do that, but there's, there's lots of innovation going on around that. Gotcha. Uh, and where do you see the usages of uh, the, these new identities accelerating the most uh, and needing the most oversight? Uh, for example, uh, RPA adoption. Right. Well, RPA has is, is kind of exploded over the last two or three years, but it's being accelerated even more mm -hmm. uh, in, in DevOps arenas uh, with multi-cloud environments and containerization. There is a lot more acceleration of identities being spun up and being eliminated at the same time. And so that's the latest wave I'm seeing. There are some facilities that can help with that, um, like Blue Prism or other RPA management uh, devices. But you're going to need something that can construct these views of identities across clouds and be agile enough to hand, handle the, the temporary nature of some of these identities. Okay. Um, let's, uh, here's an interesting one, um, more of a generic question. Why do so many companies, uh, fear spending money on cybersecurity? 
Uh, I've worked for many companies who spend the least amount as possible. I guess they, they spend more after they get breached. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, at least in the press. Um, the I think there's a it's a traditionally it's a fear of of fatalism. I think um, they don't see it as an enabler, uh, mm-hmm. especially with identity. A lot of times people see it as like the business is saying no. Um, but if you can model things well enough, then you get an insight for for how you can you can say yes. And if you think about things that that build in themselves into a workflow and make you secure, then that's a benefit to the business. Think of um, locally used, that's important to say, but locally used lockdown uh, facial or fingerprint biometric authentication on a device, right? And that is so, for iPhone users, for instance, that's so integrated that you don't think about it and yet they're secure. It's it's similar to her, uh, Winnie Nader describe it as uh, using a spoon, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's the ideal to, to integrate it in and to see benefits in usability for your users would change that. I, I think it's also last thing I'll say. I think it's also changing uh, in these last couple months because enterprises are finding out if they did scale testing, they're inter- they're finding out what was secured and what was invested in, and now there's a motivating reason, a forcing function to implement some of these controls that they may not have had before and accelerating that transition. Gotcha. Your slide deck was, uh, was amazing. Is that something that we could share post event? Yeah, we sure can. And there's actually a URL I'll give you. Uh, there's a long form journalism piece that tells Jerry's entire story, which is a good read. Great. But of course, with your aspect, you know, with your, you know, with your presentation as well. So we can put that up on Cyber Summit USA. And if someone wants to contact you or at Sailboat, should we, should they just email you? Sure, they could they could email me. Uh, they can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. I'll okay. put I'll put that in the chat if that would be helpful. I could um yeah I could send your email to the 350 executives out there if you'd like. I'll send it right now. I sure, just need, I just need your approval. Bang. There you go. Don't uh I, I disclaimer you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's all right. Thanks for asking you before you did it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, terrific. And my last question to you uh, as I asked. The FBI, a tip or two as we reopen uh, businesses in, you know, in, a, in, in the commercial environment. Great tip from the FBI. Check all the, you know, some people have gotten new laptops and new phones. They need to be checked. Uh, anything that you'd like to add to that? Um, I would say don't, don't assume we're going back to normal. Um, if, you know, a shift to identity-based security strategy is something that should have been happening all along. Sure. Um, and so I, I think that I don't expect working from home to go away. Uh, you look at statistics. And so I think you need to assume that, depending on the industry and the vertical, that that everyone's going to be working from home. So just like bring your own device, there might be a bring your own identity in the future. And so being more prepared for that now, um, take advantage of the situation and the political capital we have. Yeah, I think uh, what's probably going to be is that employees, if they choose to work at home or if they're they're going to scatter the workforce, meaning only have 50% of the employees come in at a time to reduce the closeness, they're gonna be responsible for securing their home environment. Right, right. And you're going to need something to be able to see, you know, how things are going, right? That device is now tied to the identity in ways that it never has been before. Sure. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Uh, everyone now does have your email address. Hopefully you get some <laughs> questions. It's all good. And possibly people will uh, like to check out uh, the solutions that SailPoint has to offer. Thank you so much, Mike. Entertaining Thank story. I loved it. It was wonderful. Thank All you right. Thank you. And we're going to bring up our next speaker um, uh, from IBM, Michael uh, Michael Bunyard Jr. Are you there? There you are. I'm here. How's it going? Guess what? We haven't we haven't lost anyone. So you've got a full mm-hmm. audience. I Over see here. that. That's awesome. I think this is uh, great content, and uh, I don't have anybody like Jerry in my story, uh, but I hopefully we'll build on some of the points Mike was making. And, and tie it into more of a, a zero trust story. So uh, hopefully there's, there's good continuity here. 
and, and like Mike, we want to talk about identity here because we, we think identity is a, a key pillar of, of zero trust. Um, zero trust is a concept that Forrester introduced um, some time ago um, and it has kind of evolved over time. In the beginning, it was more about, you know, you can't assume somebody inside the network is has good intentions. And so you have to, you know, never trust them and, and always verify them. There was a set of strategies around network segmentation um, to to create fences within the network so, so bad actors can't, you know, move laterally and get access to key resources. And, and the, the strategy has evolved and changed over time. Um, Gartner came out with their CARTA and um, Google came out with uh, the Beyond Corp framework. And we feel as though all of these are, are, are very interesting models. And it's important to look at your security program and understand uh, whether you're consciously uh, going after a zero trust strategy or you happen to be doing a lot of the right things in terms of um, the elements of zero trust, it's important to understand where you are at in that continuum and what's the low hanging fruit of, of best opportunities that, you, that could uh, create the best progress and move you up that maturity, um, maturity curve. A couple of the central tenets of, of a zero trust strategy is that you can enforce informed policies to protect data. So you can understand, you know, which identities are supposed to access information uh, for what purpose and what time, and that you can enforce those policies at any point. So obviously, if they're able to access that data, then you have enable them to do that. If they're not able to, or there's risk associated with accessing that data, that you can take some appropriate kind of action. And you, authentication is something that needs to happen upon every action. So. Uh, this sounds kind of scary on the surface. Um, you, you hear people talk about MFA everywhere and, you know, um, and zero trust by its, uh, by its nomenclature seems like it could introduce a high amount of friction in the process. You know, the question uh, that was asked about why is security spending people afraid to spend money on security, I think um, it's those that have the mindset that security is not enabling business and is the kind of the no department and is making things more difficult for everyone. And our point of view is that uh, you can be effective in your authentication strategy and you can authenticate everything um, without having to necessarily introduce friction. So that's one of the points that we'll drill in on. The other aspect is uh, continuousness, right? So authentication is not something that happens um, once. Um, it's not something that happens the first time an employee accesses a service. Uh, or a consumer logs into a, a portal um, because risk is not something that happens once. Risk can change uh, throughout a session and throughout an interaction. And so there's the need to continuously monitor uh, the behaviors and the, the um, metrics and the control points that are available and to be able to act appropriately to enforce those uh, policy decisions. So if you look at um, a, a, an appropriate strategy here, what, what we would encourage you is to think about the context of the identity that are available to you. Uh, what can we understand about, um, about the identity and how can we use what we understand, the context around the identity, in order to uh, evaluate risk? If we look at uh, this approach, this is a very comprehensive approach. Uh, we've talked to clients that, that have like single products that do one aspect of this approach. Um, and, you know, what those, those have a lot of merit in and of themselves, but there's no silver bullet here if you're only doing one thing or if you have three products that do all five of these things. Um, it's really important that you take a look at the risk in a holistic context, right? So um, just knowing what device they're on and what network they're coming from, that's good, but um, it depends on what else is going on in, in, in the environment. So just kind of going around this wheel, talk about the devices, of course, are, you know, classically have been the laptops and the phones that people have used to access their resources. Um, as the speaker from the FBI talked about devices now get into IoT and, and other kinds of things. Um, so we have to collect information. Certainly, the devices themselves have a lot of great information about 
um, we, we can look and see is there malware on the device? Is the, is the device jailbroken or, or rooted in some way? Is it a known device that uh, an employee uses all the time to access information? Or is it a bring your own device? Um, so understanding as much about the device itself is a, is a super critical starting point. Um, activity, um, what is the user actually trying to do here? Um, like, uh, like Mike was talking about, it's understanding how to govern those entitlements, right? So what should they have access to? What shouldn't they have access to? And managing to control that they only have access to the things that they need to do their job or to consume a service from you. So that's another zero trust concept is really managing to the principle of least privilege. The environment is important. Where is this user coming in from on the network? Is it through a VPN? Is it through a known good IP address? Is it from a known bad IP address? Um, so that's another factor that, that brings rich context. And probably the most interesting one I would say is, is behavioral biometrics. So uh, behavioral biometric solutions can look at uh, can look at the behavior of a user based on their normal baseline. So how is the person holding their phone? Are they holding it up to their left ear or their right ear? Is it the right elevation? How are they moving their mouse? Um, how are, what's their keystroke velocity like? And in cases where uh, those behaviors deviate from a known baseline or known pattern, that indicates a, a kind of a rich source of, of risk. Um, and finally, it's the account itself. Uh, what is that account supposed to have access to and, and what are its attributes? So if you build out a rich set of context, it enables what we would call adaptive access, otherwise known as risk-based authentication, right? So instead of authenticating everybody through an MFA every time they try to do something, we can pick and choose when we want to authenticate based on that level of risk. So adaptive access uh, to be enabled uh, in an effective manner uh, is an interesting challenge because developers are a rich source of um, resources that can embed identity into their solutions. Uh, yet developers don't necessarily have a lot of knowledge about identity and access management, nor do they need to be experts in, in risk profile. But if we can, if we can create an environment where um, an administrator can set a policy at a very simple level that says if there's a low level of risk, let's just let the user in. Um, if there's a medium level of risk, maybe we want to do a, an MFA challenge. Uh, if, if risk increases throughout a session, maybe we want to do a second MFA challenge. And if risk is very high, we, we want to block. Policy like that, and then in, uh, to this, um, into this policy, the continuous monitoring of the behavior and the device and the network and the user and what they're trying to do to determine risk at any point in time. I'm going to show you what this would look like just from a, an end user perspective. So um, we've got a, a user here, and, and her name is Francine. Francine could be an employee or part of our workforce. She could be a, a consumer of our services. Uh, but there's a set of information that we that we collect about Francine. Uh, part of it is the personally identifiable personally identif identifiable information about her, like her uh, location and her uh, her email and her phone number. Um, and then the other part is these part of this rich context that we can understand about her: some biometrics, um, how she normally moves her mouse, how she types, how often she uses devices, and what types of devices she uses, and where she normally is is coming in from. So, you know, in a scenario where Francine wants to access um, our network and wants to, uh, to do something, to perform some kind of action, um, we can compare what we, how we've analyzed Francine's identity against the real Francine. And if everything's looking good, like she's coming in from a known device and she's typing and moving her mouse the way she normally does and she pr provided her credentials, uh, why not make this process as seamless for Francine as possible? We've authenticated her. We've authenticated her in the background uh, based on all these rich contexts. And we've identified that Francine is the real Francine. So let's just let her in. Why should we make her jump through a hoop? Why should we make her even have to provide a credential? Let's let her in, have access, um, do her job, or consume her service. Let's say Francine's on the road. She's, uh, she's now in the UK. And um, part of the information about her checks out in terms of her credentials. 
Uh, but the part that doesn't check out is she's coming in from um, a new MAC address um, and she's coming in from a new physical location. We might just want to check that that Francine really did travel to the UK, uh, especially if there's been a reasonable amount of time between the last time she logged in in her normal location and now when she's logging in from the UK. Um, that's kind of geo velocity, right? Um, she obviously can't have gone from the United States to the UK in five minutes. Um, so that would be a, a different set of risk. But if it's been a reasonable amount of time, we'll just want to uh, perhaps do an MFA and uh, or in this case, actually just a simple authentication, just ask her to enter in her single sign on password. So that re represents very little friction for her and allows us to identify that it's the real Francine. In another scenario where we might have a potential insider threat, uh, what we see is she's coming in from the right device and the right geo. Um, she provided the right credentials, but the behavioral biometrics are different. Something's off here in terms of how she's interacting with her service. This could be for a couple of reasons. If Francine was in an office, uh, she might have stepped away from her desktop, for example, and a bad actor could be in there trying to um, get information from her account or uh, access uh, confidential information, um, or her account might have been taken over from, from a bad actor. But we definitely can use the fact that these biometrics are off as a uh, indicator of risk. The risk goes up, and we can enforce a policy based on that level of risk where we're going to do a multi-factor authentication right now. So in a case where Francine had stepped away from her desk and somebody was trying to uh, do weird things, um, Francine can get a, a, a text or a, a push notification on her phone and uh, reply whether that's really her doing those things or not. So that provides another level of security. And the final uh, scenario here, the worst case scenario would be um, that we identify based on knowing where the IP address is from um, that that Francine is trying to log in from Moscow, Russia. This is a known bad IP address. Also, the behavioral biometrics are off. There's no way we want to let her have access. We're not worried about friction in this case. We basically want to uh, deny access altogether. So I brought you through those examples just to kind of demonstrate how we authenticated and we didn't trust that Francine was the, Fran the real Francine throughout that process. Uh, we were always authenticating and we were continuously authenticating, uh, but we were able to introduce the minimal amount of friction needed. So we didn't have to choose between security and convenience. We got both aspects accomplished. It wasn't a trade-off. We were able to do both, and that's because we, we had an adaptive access approach. At IBM, uh, we, we have a platform that does all this called IBM Security Verify. Uh, it is very smart identity for today's hybrid multi-cloud world. So it, it's very comprehensive in that it includes access management, privileged access management, as well as um, identity governance. Uh, but even if your platform is from another vendor or from a mixture of vendors, ultimately our point of view is that the idea behind or the driver behind the identity platform is to be able to connect any user to any resource wherever that resource exists. And by any user, we of course mean people, employees, contractors, privileged users, uh, 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 customers, um, and then it includes APIs and things because as we've, as we've discussed during this session, identities are more than just um, individuals. And then being able to access information uh, wherever it resides means being able to support a what's increasingly very common multi-cloud hybrid environment where some resources are on-prem, some resources are on public or private clouds, and we probably even have a mixture of public and private cloud uh, providers. So um, the goal for the identity platform is, is to provide this access in as seamless way as possible while uh, still ensuring security. Adaptive access is one area of innovation. Um, identity analytics, like uh, making suggestions about entitlements, as an example, is another. And decentralized identity, is, as we've touched on, is an area that's very promising and that IBM's working with, with many clients that are in that pilot stage uh, and really, I think, represents uh, the future of, of identity moving forward. I wanted to leave you with a chart um, that can allow you to, to 
look at uh, zero trust and to try to understand where your institution sits in terms of this maturity. I don't want to, I'm not naive enough to tell you that it's all about identity. Identity or users is, is one of five key areas of zero trust. So uh, it extends into data, the applications, the device, and the network. Uh, so we need to look at each one of those uh, categories and then understand how much context can we define and then based on that context what type of verification and enforcement can we do like such as what we've discussed today and then how can we tie all of this into um, the broader um, threat detection and response strategies at our institution so taking this identity and data and application telemetry and putting it up into you know, an orchestration capability where you can open up cases and respond to uh, respond to um, uh, problems and investigate them and then take remediative action. Um, so, yeah, we would suggest that you uh, look at a chart like this and try to map out uh, where you're at. I want to leave you with a couple of resources if you want to learn more about adaptive access. Um, and some different scenarios that users like Francine can experience uh, through adaptive access. I've provided a link. Uh, we offer services around zero trust. So uh, don't think of IBM services as being only IBM product focused uh, professionals. We partner with, um, with many vendors in the identity space in particular to, um, to help you get the most out of those solutions and to help you understand how you can accelerate your, your zero trust journey. And finally, uh, Based on the remote work uh, for a scenario that's going on, we've taken our, our IDAS platform, IBM Security Verify, and offered a, offering it up at no charge um, for an unlimited amount of time. Um, so it's as easy as a registering for access, and you can begin to play around with the policies and uh, adding applications and adding users and, and seeing how that can look in, in your institutions. So thank you much, very much for your time, and I'll take any questions you might have. Hey, how are you? Yeah, we have uh, a few questions. Um, let's just go ahead and start with this one. Um, all right, what type of offering does IBM have for identity that you've discussed? Is the product offering adaptive access? Is that the product? So adaptive access is a capability within IBM Security Verify. So IBM Security Verify is a is a holistic platform. It does single sign-on, MFA. It does um, lifecycle management, um, okay. adaptive access, and analytics. So you, you it's a platform, and adaptive access is just a capability within that platform. Great. And is the IBM Security Verify product just available on the cloud or on-prem? It's available both. So, for example, we have a on-prem uh, product for access management, uh, which is IBM Security Verify Access, and it just does the on-prem access components that are needed. In a in a hybrid multi-cloud world, um, what you'll typically have is a combination, right? You'll have an, an IDAS that is managing cloud-based resources, but there's a certain presence on-prem that's needed to uh, to bring in SSO and MFA and governance for those on-prem components. So uh, Verify basically integrates with on-prem components to give you that hybrid multi-cloud capability. Okay. Um, are you planning to integrate blockchain into your identity auth authentication process? Practice, practice, well, excuse me. That's a great question. And I only just talked briefly about decentralized identity, but decentralized identity is, is an area where we've taken blockchain as the, um, as the, the, the layer of truth. And we have a, our identity is integrated in such that you can build out a digital wallet that contains your credential information. Um, right. You can issue credentials based on the blockchain and you can verify credentials based on the blockchain. So, yeah, we started that uh, earlier in the year and it's part of our portfolio now. Terrific. Um, and how do people get in touch with you? Should I share your email address or is there another place where they can go to, uh, to contact you for follow up? No, please do. Just go ahead and use the chat and uh, put in my email. Sorry for the long Michael Bunyard dot junior, but um, it's okay. But, uh, that's how you can get me. I will share it with everyone right now. You've given me uh, authentication to go ahead and do that. So now everyone has your email address. Okay. I'm sure there's some good follow. -up. We have 350 executives uh, still with us. And uh, here's another question: Have you seen increasing numbers of people working from home due to COVID uh, impact your customers? Oh, yeah. You know, for us, it's interesting because IBM, 
you know, almost 400,000 employees and 90% of us are working from home. But the impact personally was was very small because we all had worked from home a lot during the off hours and such. But our customers are in a different boat and, and there's some that were well prepared and some that weren't. So I'd say the biggest uptake is in um, more people that are looking for um, mobile device management or unified endpoint management so that they can get those uh, those unman previously unmanaged devices under control. Um, and then we embed our identity capabilities such as single sign-on and MFA into our um, mobile device management solution. So uh, we, we, we spent a lot of time early in March when everybody was working from home, putting out some, some offers to our clients to make it easy for them to get, get access to these tools for free right away deploy them. They're all IDAS and SaaS, so they're easy to deploy and get value out of them, and that's helped a lot. Terrific. And will you be able to share your slides with us uh, on Cyber Summit USA? Absolutely. Great. We uh, just got a nice comment. This is probably one of the best summits I've ever attended, so thank you very, very much, Michael, for contributing to that. And, uh, and with that being said, as I've asked the FBI and SailPoint, one or two tips that you could share with the executives that are going to be migrating back to the office. I know we've covered, you know, checking out your laptops, if you've bought new laptops and so forth, anything from an IBM perspective that people should, uh, you know, take advice on. I think my view is very much similar to Mike Kaiser's. I think that we see this as the new normal, right? So yes, people will be returning to the office. No, it won't be to the level that it was prior to COVID, right? And, you know, we've seen all around the country, um, individual companies announcing that um, they, you know, they're not going to require people to return from home if they want to work from home. I think one of the things that has happened is workers have been so productive working remotely that the, the companies are seeing the benefits of that. And they're seeing the risks associated with getting them all back into a building um, and, and, and trying to deal with the mitigation of, 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 you know, the virus. So, I think don't assume it's all going to just flip back in a month or two and we're, we're all going to be back in the office. Um, take the time that you've had to pair and scramble around COVID to bolster your ability to support remote work, of course, uh, because it's an ongoing requirement. Great. Michael, thank you so much for your time. Uh, great working with IBM. I know you're going to be joining us for a few other, maybe not you, but uh, some other experts from IBM will be joining us for some, uh, some of our future power hours. Uh, so thank you again, and hopefully we'll see you at some of our live summits uh, if we ever get back to normal in the conference industry. That would be a pleasure. Oh, you got it. Take care, Michael. Take and our care. last and final speaker is Kelly Goldblatt from the DHS uh, uh, CISA department. Um, she'll be sharing her slides. Uh, Kelly, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, Kelly, for joining us. I believe now you have uh, slide control there. There you go, perfect. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have Kelly Goldblatt from CISA, the Division of the Depart Department of Homeland Security, which she'll uh, debrief you on. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your service to our country and uh, get right into it. Uh, good afternoon. So I understand that we have a time crunch, so I will try and give this, this presentation as quickly as possible. You've got uh, 20 minutes, no worries, no worries. Okay, um, so uh, like it was mentioned, I'm the cybersecurity advisor for, um, for CISA and specifically I'm responsible for Michigan. As, as most know, it stands for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Um, our biggest thing is, is that we want to help you. Right, we want to help you not become the victim of a cyber incident, and we also want to provide assistance to you if you do end up um, experiencing an incident. Uh, this is our vision and mission statement. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind is, is that we are the nation's risk advisors. So specifically, what that means to us is, is that we want to help you with um, cyber protection, also the physical side being uh, infrastructure, so your actual buildings and, and different um, different organizations like, you know, for instance, your utility companies, ISPs, all that stuff. We want to help them become more resilient as well so that they can in turn help you become resilient. Uh, we also 
uh, provide assistance with federal network protections as well as uh, state, local government, and tribal uh, government network protection as well. And then we also do emergency communication. Um, as mentioned, the, the risk landscape for your organization is extensive, right? We're seeing pandemics now, but on a daily basis, we also have to worry about cyber attacks, insider threats, all sorts of things. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk really quickly about the cybersecurity advice, um, advisory program, which is uh, what I am and what I do. So our goal in life is to help your organization, organization become more resilient. And so what that means from our perspective is that we want to help your organization um, with things like uh, doing assessments and promoting best practices. We also want to educate and raise awareness. We also want to provide information, uh, whether it be through information sharing or through different alerts and different documents that SISL provides. Um, there are 23 of us throughout the nation. Um, depending on where your organization is, depends upon who you end up working with. Like I say, I, I'm specifically responsible for Michigan and Ohio, um, and I have counterparts all throughout the US. And our numbers are growing, so hopefully there will be a CSA in every single state within the next year or two total. Um, you know, one of the things that CISA provides assistance with, and this is on every front and group, including mine on the cybersecurity side, is we are providing assistance with uh, the risk management for COVID, right? So um, that can be um, through different uh, teleconferences that we provide to organizations. It can also be things like producing products that provide executives with, assist, with uh, assistance that may be suggestions on how to deal with things. It almost also may be things to, such as options for consideration. Um, here's another uh, resource that we've got, the Cyber Essentials Toolkit, and then also Stay Safe Online. Um, and then just talking about the cyber threat landscape, uh, so, as it was mentioned earlier, the landscape of cyber, potential cyber attacks, um, they are growing drastically every single day. Um, so, while we had to worry about, you know, traditional cyber threats in the past being an actual person today, we also have to worry about machines uh, being repurposed to do something when they were otherwise designed for. Um, here's a couple of interesting um, things that have happened over the past couple of weeks. Um, and some things to kind of think about. So on May 23rd, um, CISA did a, a joint announcement um, with another federal entity um, that basically talked about the Chinese government specifically targeting COVID-19 research. Uh, and on the 13th, we also provided an update on the Cyber Resource Hub um, to provide some additional information and cybersecurity assessments. And then also on uh, May 12th, we worked with the FBI to produce an alert uh, on the 10 most exploited vulnerabilities between 2016 and 2019. So it's important to note that these are some of the um, different resources that CISA can provide for you. Um, also, please note that all of our resources are free. Um, they are free because your tax dollars have already paid for them. So you've paid for them, you might as well get use out of them, right? Um, so moving on, just we've talked a little bit about the, throughout this day, we've talked about common threats. Um, which we are seeing the same sort of things that the past three speakers have all discussed already. So we'll go ahead and move on. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, the big thing is that we want to help you become more resilient. And so, you know, you think about like your health, for instance, and to help keep you healthy, you, you try and do things like take vitamins, go to the doctor, the preventative checks, all that sort of thing. The same should be done for your organization both on the cyber and physical front. And they're all things that can be easily done if you have that mindset of trying to be more resilient and preventative. Um, one of the things that you can do to help kind of increase your resiliency and keep things, your organization increasing in its strength is to do assessments. And you wanna do assessments um, on a continual basis. Assessments are not, or should not, I say, be a one and done type deal. Things change, threats change on a sometimes on a daily basis, right? So you want to make sure that you're currently and constantly man looking to manage and improve your organization over time. 
So in order to do that, some of the things that you need to do is to consider looking at, you know, the services that you offer. So you need to identify what those services are. And once you do that, you need to make sure that you know what your assets are. And an inventory asset um, list can help with that. You then want to be able to protect and sustain those. And you also want to be able to, and then the next step from there is you want to manage the disruption and you want to work on exercising and improvement. Right, and it's hard to manage disruptions if you don't know what your assets are. Right, so it's important to note that each of these steps build upon each other, but they also end up being something that can uh, feed upon each other as well. So specifically, we're going to take a step and look at um, some of the cybersecurity offerings. So, cybersecurity advisors, we have our counterparts on the physical side. And our counterparts are uh, the protective security advisors. Um, some of the ways in which we work together, for example, is uh, we can do an assessment on, say, a data center, and the physical advisor will physical. I'm sorry, I keep calling him physical. He's a protective security advisor. My apologies. Um, the protective security advisor, the PSA, um, they will come in and they will look for. Um, different things like uh, guns, gates, guards, your actual physical structure and how the data center is built. Whereas a cybersecurity advisor or CSA, we're going to sit down and look at, you know, how is that data center being run? What is it resilient? How is it being projected? That sort of thing. Um, these are some of the different assessments that we can do. Um, notice that there are, there are basically two fronts. We can do strategic assessments and we can provide assistance with technical assessments. Um, so, uh, specifically for uh, CSAs in particular, we are on more of the strategic side of the house, so we can provide you assistance um, with more of your um, higher level assessments where it's, we can talk with you about what's going on with your network. Um, the technical assessments are assessments that are done out of headquarters, um, and they can provide assistance um, on more of the technical side. Uh, they will do more hands on. We do not necessarily do that. The other thing that's important to note is um, COVID has not stopped these assessments from occurring. We are still up and functioning. Um, the difference is that we may have come and, well, we used to physically come and see your organization and say hi when we did assessments. Now, currently, we are doing things virtually. Um, these are some important best practices to kind of keep an eye on. Uh, and then, are there any questions, please feel free to ask. And then here is my contact information. Um, so that there's my email account. Um, if you're not located in Michigan or Ohio, I would suggest um, contacting the email address at cyberadvisors at cisa.dhs.gov. Um, they will be able to provide you with the contact information and get you in contact with the TSA that's in your specific region. That can provide assistance to you. Uh, the other thing is that, like the like the FBI has SciWatch, um, we also have uh, CISA Central, and CISA Central can provide assistance with um, incident response, and they also have a 24/7 uh, assistance line. Um, they can also get you in contact with US CERT. Um, if you're not signed up for different CISA alerts, I'd highly recommend going and doing it. You can look at um, CISA Central, or you can also go to the US. Uh, sir, the, uh, website. If there are any questions, I can take them at this time. Hey, Kelly, thank you so much for the uh, for that quick presentation. Um, what does CISA see as the greatest threat to the American? Where are we now? What does CISA see as the greatest threat to the American infrastructure? And your recommendations there. Yeah, so the thing about CISA is, is that we actually uh, provide assistance on every front. So um, what that basically means is that, you know, it honestly, it depends on what's going on right now. I mean, nation states are important and are definitely looking to attack infrastructure. Um, sure. But the pandemic right now is causing just as many problems, right? So um, right. I don't know right. that... I was going to say, perhaps maybe, is there a certain industry sector that is seeing more attempted attacks, whether it's nuclear, or oil, or uh, even, you know, renewable energy? Is there a certain 
uh, sector uh, of the market that has that is seeing more action? So we look at all 16 critical infrastructure um, sectors, and honestly, each sector is having having its own fair set of problems. Um, so right. you can sit there and say that certain organizations are, but honestly, everybody is seeing something. And I think that that's an important thing to note that nobody's alone in this, right? right. So your organization and your sector may be um, specifically of interest to nation states, right? When you look, for example, at government, which is very true, um, but right. for instance, financial institution, they're worried about nation states too, right? Um, there honestly is no one sector that is more targeted than another sector. I would say the difference right. is that certain sectors have more pl uh, publicity around their targeting or their their potential attempts. Gotcha. And some recommendations as the executives move back into the office arena. Anything that you could uh, touch upon from your expertise? Yeah, so I would say, and, and I know that this is and I kind of sound interesting, but um, I will say CISA has a great website, um, CISA Coronavirus. So it's www.cisa.gov slash coronavirus. They've got okay. all, you know, all sorts of resources and things. Um, the other thing is, is that within DHS, um, there's also the Science and Technology Directorate. Um, they have a great COVID-19 response website as well and they've even got um, a calculator that can help you look at like the decay of COVID on different surfaces that you've got throughout your office environment and then also resources like uh, the CDC and FEMA all have great um, places that you can look to try and help um, be inform more informed. Here's an interesting question. Since COVID-19, um, how big, and this could be an, a guesstimate, uh, of an increase have you seen in cyber attacks percentage wise, meaning let's call it uh, from like February 1st to now, has it been the same amount of cybersecurity uh, attempts or have the cyber criminals just gone wild and tried to attack everything, you know, pretend, you know potentially thinking that the guard is down? Yeah, so we've, we've actually seen a mixture of of that. Um, so you have the uh, traditional attacks that happen. And then, for instance, like we put out the alert about, um, for, for instance, China attacking or being doing more attacks towards healthcare systems, right, because of some of the research and stuff that they've been doing. So they've, they've gone, there's been an increase on that front that we've seen. Um, and then also, you know, the other thing is, is that we are seeing quite a, quite a bit of incidents where um, there's the perception that the guard is down or that people are busy doing other things and that now is a good time to take advantage of the current situation. Um, obviously, with every every type of um, major event, there's always an increase in themed phishing attacks, right, and spam emails to try and trick users into um, clicking or doing things that they, they shouldn't necessarily do. So on that front, that's been pretty standard. We typically see that for any major event, um, but still, you know, again, it, it is an increase in that it is focused on this. So. I'm sure we're gonna see lots of phishing schemes of, you know, coming back to the office, COVID update, and everyone's gonna be clicking on that, and then God knows what's going to happen. So yeah, trust no one uh, is always the, is the policy, zero trust. Um, uh, Kelly, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I see you got your information up there. We typically share the slides. I think that's okay with you guys. And uh, this way that they could uh, follow up with you uh, in the case of a breach. Um, uh, again, I uh, you know don't have any more questions coming in. So Kelly, at this point, thank you so much and uh, appreciate your service to our country. And hopefully we'll see you at one of our future summits. Sounds good, thank you. Great, thank you. And to those people that are with us, and about 90% are, I'm just gonna shoot up for our upcoming, um, for our upcoming uh, events, we are going to be going virtual with uh, our cybersecurity summits uh, starting at the end of July. And then we are going to uh, host virtual summits all throughout the country 
in different uh, in different uh, hot topic uh, covering all the different hot topics and all the the biggest regions uh, from now up until December, and then hopefully in 2021 we will back uh, producing our live cybersecurity summits. And uh, again, we thank you for joining us. Uh, contact information uh, will be on the slides, and it's up on your screen right now. And I've also shared our social media links with all of you uh, in the chat area. And uh, we look forward to having you join us as well in the future. So thanks again. And uh, we'll be signing off right now. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care and stay safe. We created IoT Nation to help professionals like you navigate the IoT space to find the companies, people, use cases, and events that are most relevant for you. On IoT Nation, you can browse over 25,000 IoT-related companies and dive into the details for specific ones. You can also search geographically, zoom into any area of the map, and explore companies in any city. You can find applications in various verticals, such as smart buildings, smart cities, connected mobility, and many more. And you can plan your week and month ahead by searching dozens of online and offline events to find the ones that are most relevant for you. For all Cyber Summit Power Hour attendees, we are offering free use of IoT Nation Pro for 30 days with the code Cyber2020V. If you have any questions, contact us at info at iotnation.com.